All right, so I'm back with another check-in video regarding House of Chains. I've been chipping my way through it. Right now I'm at page 625 out of 1045, so I'm roughly two thirds of the way through. And I think I'm gonna finish this up within the next week or so. So I wanted to stop in and go over my thoughts based on where I'm currently at. Let's start with some overall thoughts. I still kind of agree that this has been a different pacing from the other books. When I say, maybe it's not a different pacing, but there hasn't been any huge battles yet in this book. It's been a lot of smaller individual stories where we're gaining a lot of different information that's helping to continue to build the world. And I have no problem with that. I'm really enjoying the book so far. But in contrast to Memories of Ice, where we had two massive sieges, one of the sieges was already picking up by the time you got halfway through the book. You know, this is a little bit of a change. You can even look at book one and book two. In book one, you had the Siege of Pale, and then you had conflict at Daryugistan. And then in book two, you had uh, the Chain of Dogs, which was continuous throughout the entire book, where you're constantly having like big battles and combat scenes. And that's not to say that House of Chains might have a big battle in the last third of the book. That's totally possible. But at this point in time, we haven't had anything too crazy other than this one fight that happened with uh, Cutter and Aspilar, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But yeah, overall, really enjoying the book. I think it's a bit funny that my last video ended where it did uh, with Karsa because I didn't have that much farther left to read in order to finish off that first POV. Uh, section of the book. As I talked about in the first video, I really enjoyed that we followed Karsa for such a long period of time at the beginning of the book. I thought that was pretty interesting and was a nice change of pace for me. I think after that first check-in video, I had roughly uh, 80 pages left to go in that POV. Um, and I was definitely surprised by where things are left off with Karsa. I was not expecting him to be the Thelemin uh, Tablaki who... Uh, is the bodyguard of the Shaikh, or Felison rather, from Dead House Gates. I didn't see that coming at all. So when we got to that final conclusion of that first POV, I was like, holy shit, that was an incredible way to wrap up the first book. And it gives such a good backstory for that character. Um, all of a sudden, that character went from being somebody who was not very important at all, just kind of a mysterious giant with clearly a ton of combat skill, into this big important character who has now has tons of backstory and I actually care a lot about and am looking forward to seeing where his storyline goes. There was also a lot of good information that was handed out in the rest of that POV section. There was a lot more allusions to the House of Chains in that section. So after after Karsa is captured by the Malazans, he's put on this slave ship, he's strapped to this pallet and eventually strapped to like the mass of the ship and he's there for months reportedly and fit, like drifting in and out of consciousness and nobody can seem to wake him up and then at some point down the line apparently he starts screaming in his sleep and when he starts screaming this massive storm filled with magic starts appro approaching the ship and Erickson describes that the storm is like literally unleashing these massive chains into the ocean. It's creating these violent explosions in the water and there's lightning and red mist. And just, it seems like overall just a general nightmare manifested in re the reality of these sailors lives. And they start blaming Karsa for this manifestation, obviously because they think it's connected to his screaming. And I think later on we come to realize that yes, it totally is connected to Karsa in one way or another. We're not really entirely sure how or why, but it seems to be that way. But when Karsa wakes up, he has no idea what's going on, and the ship ends up getting hit by one of these chains, and everybody is thrown into the water. Yeah, lo and behold, they're no longer in reality, they're in a warren now. Not entirely sure which warren this is. It's very similar to uh, the warren, very similar to the warren that Haboric and those three Malazan soldiers, along with Felicin, end up in after they escape uh, the Otteratl, Otteratl, whatever, uh, Otteratl mines in Deadhouse Gates. And you even see, like, later on, Karsa uh, encounters the same ship that they encountered in, in Deadhouse Gates. And then you find out that Karsa is the reason that the Tiste Eaters are dead in the, uh, the cabin, which that was just a great realization and great connection between the two books. But it's still not entirely clear to me what Warren this is all taking place in. But again, I'm sure that will be filled in in due time. 
One character I thought was really interesting is this archaeologist figure that appears towards the end of the first book, the first subbook. Karsa is able to escape that Warren with uh, the help of the slavers who encaptured him. Silgar is this mage, and he's able to open a portal that the other slavers and Torvald Nam and Karsa all jump through. It spits them out into an ocean and they wash up on this beach. And then Torvald Nam and Karsa end up going on a walk and they come across this crazy tower where there's an archaeologist on the inside and he's like reconstructing the bones of what it seems to be like a dinosaur of some kind. As they're visiting with this strange archaeologist character, Karsa is just being his stubborn blunt self and ends up getting into an argument with the the archaeologist and gets into this fight and the archaeologist ends up breaking his ribs with one punch and flattening him out knocking him unconscious who the fuck is this guy and how is he able to do this because based on all the information we have about Karsa it's only very very powerful figures who can do damage to him and this guy seemed to have like no problem at all dealing with Karsa. He barely broke a sweat. I don't know. I, you know, people in the comments have been telling me that not everything comes back around in these books and that some things are just meant to be there to build the world a little bit more. I have no idea if this character will come back, but he must be on some sort. He must either be a high mage or an ascendant of some kind. I don't know, but I'm curious to see what role he has to play, if any, moving forward. Even though it doesn't go in this order in the book, I'm just going to talk through the rest of Karsa's storyline really quick because I think it makes the most sense to just put this all in one location in the video. Karsa and Torval Nam eventually separate. Uh, Karsa is imprisoned again by the Malazans at some point in time. And while he's imprisoned again, he uh, comes into contact with this new human character who's going to help him escape. That character ends up being Leoman, who is also from Dead House Gates. Uh, we knew in Dead House Gates that the two of them uh, were paired up together in one way or another to defend the Shaikh. So that made sense, but was also a nice reveal. It was nice to see how they met, he met each other. Um, and then, yeah, they proceed to escape and travel to the whirlwind. You know, the end of the first sub book is Karsa and Leo Min at the top of a mountain and they're looking out over the desert and Leo Min's describing uh Shaik and where they're gonna go and uh it's just a nice little cliffhanger to set you up for the rest of the book there's one other scene to note uh before we move forward and that's the scene where Karsa finally gets his hands back on Silgar the slaver he ambushes Sil the slaver and these Malazan soldiers in the middle of the night at their campsite and butchers a bunch of them and then captures Silgar alive proceeds to cut off his arms and legs uh leaving them as just stumps bleeding stumps and then wraps them up in bandages in order to keep him alive leoman kind of tries to persuade him to just let him die and leave him there but karsa essentially says uh this guy tried to drive me mad he's you know broke the spirits of the sunid and i'm gonna the only way i'm gonna get revenge is by driving him mad before i kill him and that's what he does, that's for sure, uh, as you see later on in the book. It was a little bit intense, and also, you know, if I'm trying to be realistic, there's no way that this guy would survive without his arms or legs just because of a couple of bandages. But you know what, we'll just suspend our disbelief for the book. In some ways, it was satisfying to watch Karsa get his revenge in that way. So then moving forward... Karsa and Leoman go meet up with Shaikh. Karsa then spends some time being a bodyguard for Shaikh and living in the camp that's within the whirlwind. It doesn't seem like he acclimates very well to the camp lifestyle or to being part of this army. I don't get the sense that he really connects with their motives or ideas. Based on what I can remember, I don't have any specific notes about this, but based on what I can remember, it seems like the more time he spends with humans, the more he realizes that they're all just kind of fighting over who is in charge of who. That there's really no difference between the leadership of these different factions. It's all just the same shades of gray. I do think that's a true assessment by Karsa. There doesn't seem to be like, there doesn't seem to be one faction that's particularly worse than the others. Like the rebels are no better 
than the Malazans in a lot of ways. Um, you know, it's just that these rebels want to be the ones in control of the seven cities. At some point in time, Karsa then builds this temple to his seven gods, and then also to uh, Delum and Baroth. He carves uh, all of these guys' likenesses into these rock trees that are found somewhere within this camp. I thought it was cool that Delum and Baroth then come back as ghosts to join Karsa in his journey. I think the commentary that Baroth and Delum provide as Karsa starts to begin his, the second half of his journey, it's helpful. It's helpful to have some more Teblor POVs commenting on what's going on with Karsa. We'll see what happens with these two spirits. Maybe they get put back into flesh at some point in time. But I think for the most part, they're just meant to be Karsa's guides moving forward and to also give some more information about what he's doing and what his end goals are. I don't even think Karsa knows what his end goals are, but they're starting to become more and more concrete as we move forward. Karsa then begins the second half of his journey. It seems like his first goal is to get a horse that he can ride, which means he's going to have to get a horse that was raised by the Jag or the Jagut. And so he's on a journey to find one of these horses. Along the way, he encounters a Carrium and Mapo, which I thought was a great scene. In some ways, it left me confused, again, about the power levels of all these characters. Acarium is meant out to be basically the end of the world with the amount of power that he has. In some ways, you're not sure if Karsa is going to trigger this. They end up getting into a fight, and Acarium breaks Karsa's blood sword. But at the same time, Karsa is able to counterattack with a punch of his own and then knocks Acarium unconscious. Again, I have no idea who's more powerful than who in this storyline. But somehow, yeah, that happens and the end of the world does not take place. Mappo seems to actually like just be pleased with how things uh, end up happening. I think he knew that there was going to be some sort of conflict between the two of them. And he's just glad that it didn't trigger, you know, the bloodlust that Akarium has locked away in, inside of himself. There's no way that these two won't fight again at some point. So Looking for, forward to that in the future, I have a feeling it'll be a much more uh, impactful conflict when that does happen. And I think it also sets them up to be on opposite sides of the battlefield. Yeah, I'm not sure. I still, I'm, at this point, I'm still very confused about what's going on. And I think that's okay. But anyway, after the fight with Icarium, Karsa then uh, takes a shortcut through a warren and witnesses the aftermath of a battle between the Talana Mas and uh, a Jagut. He then finds the Jagut alive and entrapped in some sort of magical uh, circle, which he then proceeds to destroy after the warning of the Jagut. The Jagut seems to think that the magic will be sufficient enough to destroy Karsa, but Karsa just like, you know, grits his teeth and smashes through it somehow. So clearly, even without his blood sword, he has some sort of shield when it comes to magic magic seems to just like wash off of him for some reason i don't know if the autoradal dust is just like embedded in his skin but that's that's the vibe that i'm getting he releases the jagu this jagu gives him information about where to get a horse apparently and then he leaves the warren and the last bit that i've read about karsa is he finds this massive valley where there's a mine of flint and this is the flint that the Talana Mas used to use for their their weapons. And he finds his way into this cave and there's just like all of these alcoves where weapons are being hoarded away um, from Talana Mas who have died. At least that's that's what it feels like. I'm curious if this is like a storage facility of some kind. Like will these weapons be used again by armies of the Talana Mas? Unsure, but that's a hypothesis that I have at the moment. Then we get a big reveal. Karsa summons his seven gods, calls them into this mine of flint. It seems at some point along the line, he's put two and two together and realized that these seven gods were Talana Mas, but they're Talana Mas that are unbound or not bound by the ritual. So they're not under the main control of the Talana Mas that we saw get released by Ekovian at the end of Memories of Ice. So they're still around and still maintain their power to some degree. A little bit more gets revealed. Essentially, somehow these seven are connected to the House of Chains. 
I don't know. It, that's why they seem to bind. It seems like they set a curse on Karsa where every soul that he kills is now bound to him by chains. And that's these visions that he's having throughout his journey. Karsa has seemed to put this together at this point. And then the seven f- end this chapter by telling Karsa that he's the knight of the house of chains. And Karsa seems to know this. I'm a little disappointed in some way because I know house of, the house of chains is the crippled god's house. And I don't know, I kind of wanted Karsa to be a good guy or somebody to root for. I don't I don't know why I like this character, but I do. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that if he's working with the crippled god. So we'll see what happens moving forward. But it definitely seems to be putting him on the other side of the battlefield than the people who seem to be working against the crippled god. So, and those are the only, that's the only distinct line that I have at this moment for this book is like there's the crippled god and his team, and then the people who are trying to, to defeat the crippled god. And even these characters are not necessarily good, but they're better than the rest because they're working together to stop the crippled god. That's my that's my assessment of the overall arc of the story, but we'll see how this plays out. One thing I'm super pumped about is the fact that Fiddler is back in the story. I really enjoyed the way that he gets worked back in. Basically, Steven Erickson just starts writing from this new point of view. It's this character called Strings. He appears to be a veteran of some kind. He's a part of the army that Adjunct Tavor is bringing to the city of Aaron after the disaster of the Chain of Dogs. And you get this idea that this guy is a salty old veteran who just knows too much about military life already for some reason. And the other recruits are giving him a little bit of attitude uh, because they're not they're not sure why this guy is so cocky about his experience, but he is. And long story short, eventually it gets revealed that he's Fiddler. And not to everybody. He keeps it secret from most people, but a couple key characters recognize him and go, oh, this guy's a fucking bridge burner. And that is just one of the... I don't know what it is, but I think that's one of my favorite things about good books is that the, the way an author sets up a reveal... Something like this. This is a very simple, it feels like a very simple reveal. It's just this character turns out to be somebody we already knew. But when it finally gets revealed that Strings is Fiddler, I just go, oh, this is a fucking badass moment. And it put a smile on my face. And this is what I read for is just this kind of experience where I feel like Fiddler is one of my best friends and I... I'm just super pumped that he's back in the story. The fact that Fiddler was back in the story immediately made me more confident about the possible success of Adjunct Tavor and her like newly fledged army and, and their possible success because it wasn't looking good based on all accounts. So anyway, it's just really nice to have him back. Moving on, let's talk about Adjunct Tavor a little bit. Adjunct Tavor seems to be a very capable person She seems very smart by all accounts and flexible. She's willing to change her plans if the need arises or somebody makes a good argument to persuade her one way or another. That's not to say she doesn't have a firm hand. It seems like she's made for her position. There's no question that she deserves to be adjunct, I think. The question is going to be, does she deserve to lead an army? And that's what we're going to find out, I think, at the the end of this book. The main challenge that she's had up until this point in the book is living up to the memory of Coltane. Coltane left these massive boots to fill after the chain of dogs. And I personally don't think that adjunct Tavor will ever live up to the memory of Coltane in these soldiers' eyes. But she can do her best, I think. And that's what she's going to have to do. She's going to have to realize that she'll never be Coltane to these people, but she's got to forge a new relationship with them. And the only way she can do that is in part by honoring Coltane and what he did before her, I think, in my eyes. So far, she's on the path to do that. I am rooting for her too. I want her to prove herself to this army. There's one particular moment uh, in Aaron when she's gathering the legions, uh, these three legions that she's formed. She's gathering these legions into the square in order to check on them. Uh, It's some sort of... uh, It's basically just a roll call to make sure, hey, you're being disciplined, you're acting like a soldier, you got your sword, you got your armor, everything's cleaned and taken care of, etc., etc. And during this roll call that she does, uh, there's this terrible incident where a 
she's down in front of the soldiers and somehow a baby gets on stage and the baby has like this bone in its hand and it kind of like holds it up to the army and it's just this terrible scene where it just looks like a curse is being set on the whole army the child is a metaphor for adjunct tavor like this adjunct who is very smart and capable is still a child when it comes to combat she's never led an army before so this army of recruits is looking for her to prove herself and she has not done yet done that so far so when the baby holds up this bone i think it just scares the shit out of everybody they pretty much all think they're doomed before their battle has even started after this omen kind of like sets this terrible air of fear over the army fiddler and a couple other veterans are able to actually come up with a plan to fix that and it's basically this concept of just owning the curse itself they go and they dig up uh, cemeteries and basically grab all of these bones and start pinning them to their clothes and making earrings out of them and jewelry and making it a part of their uh, uniform moving forward as a way to just kind of own the curse and i think this is just a good life lesson in general when life gives you terrible situations the best way to handle them is just to own it whether it's maybe you said something you shouldn't have said or you did something you shouldn't have done the best way to handle that is to just be honest and admit whatever fault you have or lie you told or forgive whoever needs to be forgiven and just kind of like move forward and get through the obstacle because the longer you you know, spend spinning in anxiety before that obstacle, the the worse it's going to get. And so that's what Fiddler and the rest of the army do is they just kind of, you know, they deal with this anxiety, they own it, make it a part of themselves and just move forward. And it turns out to be a great decision because then Adjunct Tavor kind of like hops on board with this whole um, way of dealing with it. In House of Chains, it appears that there's a conflict going on in the House of Shadow. Cotillion and Amanus appear to be in battle or yeah, they appear to be battling some force that's trying to take over the Warren of Shadow. And at this point, I don't really know what that other force is, but I think, I mean, it ha- obviously has something to do with the Tisti, the Tisti Eater who keep making their way into the book. And it becomes the most evident at the Battle of Drift Avali, which is this island, this floating island that actually holds the uh, Throne of Shadow on it. And Cotillion sends Cutter, who used to be Crocus, and Asblar to this island in order to defend the Throne of Shadow. And then he gives Cutter a, a Hound of Shadow to uh, to take with him, essentially, or you know put at put at his command i feel like this is a new development in the books i don't remember in the other books getting any inkling of this battle going on in the house of shadow or that it might be up for grabs for some reason but it that's definitely the way that it's appearing to be so at the moment i feel like this scenario is just getting more and more complex because amanus used to be the emperor cotillion used to be the leader of the talon which is this group of assassins that the emperor had control of in order to influence political uh, proceedings across the various continents on this world. They were different from the Claw in a few ways. I think the main difference that I can pick up on is that the Talon was supposed to be acting outside of the Empire and the Claw was supposed to be acting within the Empire. And then there was some sort of massive conflict when there was a regime change and Lysine took power. It was kind of rumored that the Talon were eliminated and killed off, but that doesn't seem to be quite the case. That seems to be inklings that the Talon is still around. And now I'm kind of wondering if Cotillion is trying to rebuild the Talon in his own way. And my only, re- you know, my only reason for thinking that is we used to have, you know, in the previous book we had Bowden, who was the Talon. And now we have Kalam, who's working for Cotillion again in the Warren of Shadow. And Cotillion has sent him on sort of some sort of mission, but we don't really know what that mission is just yet. At least I don't where based on where I've read up to. But if he's working for Cotillion and he used to be a claw, maybe he's a Talon now or I don't know. We'll see. And you could also say that Aspilar and Cutter would be good candidates to be Talons as well. So. It might make sense if Cotillion and Amanus are trying to still influence the Empire in one way or another. But to wrap it up, it now seems like their main focus is whatever this other 
power is that's trying to take over the Warren of Shadow. Okay, I'm going to keep talking in circles if I keep recording more, so I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, if you enjoyed this review, please throw me a like down below, uh, drop a comment. The few people who have commented on these videos so far, I really appreciate that. It's nice to get some feedback that people enjoy hearing what I have to say about these books or they're just looking for another person to enjoy the experience along with. And that's kind of what I'm doing here is I don't have anybody to talk to about these kind of books. None of my friends read these kind of books. People just give me blank stares when I talk about Malzan Book of the Fallen. So I figured why not put my thoughts out in video format and see if other people are feeling the same way that I am. So yeah, drop a like or a comment, maybe subscribe if you want to see the next ones. And I will see you in the next video, which should be part three of the House of Chains series. So look forward to that in the near future.